on to the organizational updates now. So we've got quite a few to get through. Um, so I'm afraid that they are quick turnarounds, but I think we've got everyone online. So I'm going to start hopefully with Lauren from the WFSA. I see a WFSA sign. So hopefully you're yeah, I'm, uh, okay. showing it's WFSA HQ, but yeah, yeah. hi everyone. I'm, I'm Lauren Highland. Thank you very much. No problem. Am I okay to share my screen? Okay. Is everyone able to see that? No, but you should be able to. It might take a minute. One panelist can share it. Strange. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Let me just get rid of that. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Lauren Highland. I'm a projects officer at the WFSA, uh, working within the programs team. And so I will of course be giving the WFSA update today. Let me just make that bigger. Uh, so as always, the WFSA secretariat has been working really hard with secretariat and volunteers to implement our various programs, uh, whether that's our long running programs, continuing them, restarting various programs that we had to hold due to the pandemic or starting new programs as we join into new partnerships and increase our capacity both within the programs team and within the wider secretariat in general. So I could speak for some time about all the programs we run. Uh, I know we're on a tight schedule, so I just wanted to talk to you about two of our major programs that I'm primarily involved in, so I feel most qualified to speak about also. Uh, the first of which is our WFSA fellowship program. So this started in 1996. Um, since then, we've trained over 500 anesthesiologists, but due to the pandemic, this had to stop in 2020. So we had two programs that were able to keep running in 2021, but the first had the, the rest had to stop uh, until this year. So there's been a massive push to restart as many of our programs as possible. Um, the real impact of the program is not just uh, training and educating the fellows themselves, but also then the dom domino effect that that creates in developing leaders and clinical educators when they go back to their home countries and institutions. So when we're at full capacity, this is what our program looks like. So spread across the world, spread across specialties, timeframes, um, institutions. So we have programs in 15 countries across 24 institutions. We have 57 individual places and we now have 12 specialties that we offer. Seeing as we're restarting this year, we're not able to work at full capacity. So we're working at just over half capacity or that's the aim. Um, so for example, where you see two fellowships, usually that will be one or where there's usually four, we'll have two. And some of the programs just weren't ready to restart this year. So we're hoping to um, tackle those in 2024. Uh, at the moment then we have 28 confirmed fellows for 2023 that will be starting throughout the year. Um, across 20 programs and then we're still liaising with five other programs to hopefully get them started so that could be upward of 30 fellows for this year um, we have nine in place at the moment and we have three more starting in May so it's all running along really nicely um, another exciting thing is that this year we've actually started three new fellowships so one of those is regional anesthesia in Nairobi um, another is the neuroanesthesia in Bangkok in Thailand, which is particularly exciting because it's a new specialty that we haven't offered before. And then another is a paediatric fellowship in Zeneca in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which again is pretty remarkable because the fellowship head was actually once a WFSA fellow in Belgrade. So what I was saying before about the real impact of the programme Obviously that can happen in a variety of ways, but that's one of the most clear cut demonstrations of how the fellows then go on to spread what they've learned, uh, their techniques, education training to everyone else that they work with. Um, so that's the programme for this year. 
We're hoping to get back up to full capacity next year or as close to as possible. Um, but yeah, this is one of our biggest programs that we're, we're very proud to have restarted this year. Um, and another of those, a lot smaller scope, but still equally as important is our Liberian Doctors Programme. So it's about building anaesthesia capacity in Liberia, because prior to the inception of the project in 2018, there were no physician anaesthesia providers in Liberia. Um, so since then, we've been able to train, and you can see on this little graphic here, um, three uh, physicians to then become physician anaesthesia providers, two of which have gone back to Liberia to continue their work, and one, Dr. Maimi, who is continuing to membership level and then is hoping to attain his fellowship qualification. And then Dr. Blair is hoping to get to the same level, but he's just further behind as he started later. So the overall intention is to produce the first anesthesiologist in Liberia, um, but the program's running really, really well, um, and we just hope to continue it in future. Um, so that was the two projects that I wanted to give an overview of. Uh, if you want to hear more about WFSA, what we do, what we offer, obviously you can contact us via email, via our social media sites, or if you can, we'd love to see as many of you as possible at the World Congress of Anesthesiologists. Uh, which is in Singapore, 3rd to the 7th of March, 2024. Um, we are expecting to host thousands of anesthesiologists from all around the world um, and have over 350 international speakers. So it's a truly global event. Um, registration opens on the 4th of May um, and there will be tiered pricing to make the tickets as accessible as possible. So the tiers will be based on uh, whether you come from a high income, upper middle, lower middle or low income country um, and any information that you could need to know about WCA can be found at this link here or equally you can contact us at our various social media um, sites or contact secretariat members via the website and we'll be happy to share more information on WCA or any of our other projects. So thank you for uh, letting me give the WFSA update today. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Lauren. That's amazing and amazing what you're getting back to as well. Um, congratulations. And hopefully we'll see you in Singapore next year. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, SAFE and I think Jolene should be online to give us an update. Uh, yep. Hi. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm just going to give a, a verbal update on what SAFE has been up to over the past year. So our face-to-face -face courses have uh, fully resumed, um, initially kind of at a steady pace, but, but now in full swing. And we had quite a bumper month in February when we had uh, six courses over that month. We've had, I would say, about 20 courses in the past year, um, including SAFE, OBS, PEDS and OR courses. And these have been across numerous countries. So we've had courses in Tanzania, Ethiopia, Somaliland, Zambia, Uganda, South Africa, Kenya, the Republic and Democrat Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as Bangladesh, Cambodia, Indonesia and Honduras. So quite a, a range of course spread. And importantly, many of the courses have been run locally, either with no or with very minimal international faculty. And increasingly, we're also utilizing um, regional trainers for our course delivery. In spring 2022, we had the first hybrid SAFE OB course uh, that was run as an online course, followed by multiple regional in-country skills days. And that was in Liberia, where we had over 65 providers that completed the online course. An abbreviated version of the SAFE OBS online course was also run in Myanmar at the beginning of this year. And the Safe Peds online course is uh, very near to completion now uh, under the work of uh, Lyndon Baxter. There's been a few new developments. So we've had a new optional module for the Safe OB course, which is focused around obstetric fistula. And we've run that during a Safe OBS course in Kenya recently. The training of the trainers course has also been updated um, fully. So we're now running the updated version. We've also had a Safe Peds Cleft course developed. Uh, this is a cleft specific version of the Safe Pediatric course. And this was completed and has now been finalized following two pilot courses. The first of that was in Uganda in September, and then the second was in Tanzania in January. 
And we've had the first final version of the course run in Madagascar just last month. So that's now a well underway and well established course. Safe Peds has been translated into Khmer for our courses in Cambodia, and we have had one there. And our French translations are in the process of being checked and updated uh, with some ongoing further translations of new materials. We've also had the UK version of the Safe Peds course, the Safe Peds GBI, that has been translated into Japanese. And we've had several online and hybrid courses run by the, the JSPA, which is the Japanese Society for Pediatric Anesthesia. And they're also planning some face-to-face -face workshops at their annual society meeting later this year. The Safe Peds GBI courses have been run across two UK locations, as well as conference workshops. And there's four further courses planned later this year and also UK training of trainers in May. We've uh, been trialing the Global Anesthesia Safety Gas Cards uh, distribution during some recent courses, um, and we're having some ongoing discussions regarding their inclusion as a safe resource uh, during our courses. And those cards were created by uh, Sam Goodhand and Matt Kalenga and had previously been piloted in Zambia. An earlier uh, behavioural science study on the impact of SAFE has now been published in the Psychology and Health Journal. And we've also had a new publication on the impact of SAFE courses, which utilise direct observations in the OR, which has been accepted by Anesthesia Journal and should hopefully be in print later this month. And that would take the number of SAFE publications up to nine. And there's been numerous presentations about um, projects and safe work at several conferences, including by faculty from Tanzania, and that's been at the, the ASA American meeting and also at the All Africa Anesthesia Congress. So uh, quite a busy year and nice to see things are, are really back up and running, as well as several new developments. Great. Thank you so much, Jolene. That was a really um, impressive update on how SAFE is going and translated into so many different languages as well. It's fantastic. Next, I think, is um, Jan, who's going to give us an update on both the IRC, so the International Relations Committee, and the Global Anesthesia Surgery and Obstetric Collaboration, that's GASOC. So hopefully Jan is here to deliver those two updates for us. Yes, I am. I'm currently in South Africa with a lot of sunshine. Just give me one second to it turn around. Beautiful though. <laughs> um, yeah, we're load shedding, so there's a lot of beauty with no much electricity. Right, um, so which one do you want me to do first, IRC or um, Gasol? I don't mind. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'll try and send the sunshine, but I'll take some first from wherever Nate said. So you said gas up first or IRC first? Sorry, I was a bit distracted. I don't mind. Right. But I'll just start with IRC because that's what I can talk for ages. So if you've seen, can you see my slides? Yep. Cool. Great. Let's go back to the beginning because safe and the tree just done there. Hi, Jolene. Great. So um, hello all. Um, I'm Jan. Um, I have two hats on today, like we talked about. So currently in the next five minutes, I think I've got given seven for this one. Um, for the next five minutes, I'm going to hold my hat as the uh, Association of Anesthetists. I've been corrected many a times that I need to actually say that um, instead of AAGBI because it's the new branding. The IRC is the International Relations Committee. And I've just been appointed in late February, early March as the new International Fellow um basically um replacing London probably not to the best effect yet um but um as the international fellow few things that I'm just going to say today um so talk about something you know and talk about something that is new and I'm aware there might be some audience that don't know what IRC is so these are our uh, uh major members so the Association of Anesthetists has two major arms. There's a functional arm and there's a charitable organization. But the IRC sits under the charitable organization. And when I asked Tay what is the core function of IRC, which is the chair, current chair and also VP of the AOA, she basically uh, said, it's like a table 
of people where all parties come along and discuss things. And that's what I'm going to directly verbatim quote to you because I've just been in post for a month. Um, we've got very key members like the Royal College of Anesthetists, uh, which I know are here, uh, World Anesthesia Society, WFSA, which just talked about the amazing things, especially in Liberia, and SAFE, obviously RA UK. Um, we have three core functions. One is granting, um, and one is advocating, and one is fundraising. So we talk about the grants first. So there are five different grants. Um, you can take the QR code now if you want to, um, but a lot of them won't be too uh, distant from you. So these are the deadlines. So SAFE's grant deadline is on the 17th of May. Um, so if you want to run a SAFE course, um, uh, that is the deadline. Um, items one, two, four, and five, their next deadline um, is on the 9th of August. So we um, so you can have a look and do the QR code and those are the deadlines. So there's e-grant that's around about 5,000 pounds up to, um, and then there's an the international project one that's up to 20,000 pounds. Then the international voluntary that has to be more than a month up to 20,000. And there's an international travel that's up to 1,000 for a short-term trip. So it should cover most things, uh, but uh, people need to be UK based. Um, so that's where we are. Save has done the update. I'm just helping Jolene a bit about this fundraising initiative for Save Africa. Um, that's joint. Uh, it's on the website as well. Um, Ten pounds paying for twenty participants to receive Save training materials. Great and wonderful and very noble. Then there's something new, which is the next thing. Again, have a look at this. Some of you, I think, I recognise your name because I briefly had a look at the results. So it's about the international book survey. So there is the International Book Programme, um, which uh, the AOA runs. Um, the in International Book Survey is to make sure that the needs and the distribution are met. Um, so basically, it would ask you what specialty of books you want, including any titles that you want. And we actually want everyone to, not just English face, everyone to fill it in. So I've sent it to a lot of my contacts. And um, based on those things, um, the International Book program will send uh, textbooks uh, accordingly. Um, then we've got something new as well. So this is also part of the IRC helping out. Basically, there's the pilot editorial fellowship um, advocating for anesthesia and anesthesia reports. Deadline is the 31st of May. There is a, a sizable honorarium once people are appointed. Um, and it's a September to September initiative. So if you in your own uh, LMIC based areas of resource pool settings, they use the word LMIC. And I know Dylan's going to correct me. Um, but um, if you have people that are in those areas um, that are promising and basically want to explore more about publishing and editing, then feel free to join them. Uh, like I said, deadline is 31st of May. Um, and even and don't hesitate to email Andy Klein. He's very happy to answer questions. I've applied unsuccessfully for the editorial um, for anesthesia, but he gave me very good feedback and talked to me about how to re-apply um, next year. So he's very good in terms of uh, helping people to apply. So if we've still got a month or two months or so, so feel free to speak to Andy about it. Again, this is another QR code. Um, going forward, we've got three things that we're going to talk about. So number one is the major thing that me, uh, I've been talking to Tay Sheraton, Dr. Tay Sheraton about, is to increase the comm strategy of uh, IRC. So you might see some big videos coming up or you might see some podcasts coming up. And then there are, um, and then we'll work on the, grant evaluation reports, because I had a look at them. I found them a little bit clunky from a trainee perspective. So we're going to do some edits on those. And obviously, um, there's Safe OR, which um, Jolene has talked about. So that'll be launched soon. This is my email address. If you want to talk to me, you're more than welcome to or not to. And I can take any questions about the IRC for the limited knowledge I have so far. Any other questions? And I shall move on.
Whilst I'm moving, you can still ask questions and I will move on to my next presentation. Any questions? So, gas dog, uh, another thing that's very close to my heart. Um, just one person, can you see my slide? I've shared again. Yes. Good, wonderful. So guess what? Um, global anesthesia surgery and obstetric collaboration. We're coming down. So going from the high highbrow down to the root root root. So this is a trainee initiative organization, actually. Um, it's based on the Lancet report that you know, the 4.8 billion people that are lack of access to safe and affordable surgical care. Now, guess what? Global anesthesia surgery and obstetric collaboration. We start in 2015. And we're changing the words as encouraging training and subconsultant grades to engage responsibly and impactfully for global surgery. It is primarily set as an entry level platform. It is about to be a trainee engagement, but we don't send people out anywhere. Um, and we're currently uh, growing. So we're currently transitioning our status. Um, if you want to know this very boring thing that we're going from an unauthorized unauthorized organization which is a legal entity somehow uh in england or uk rather um to a community interest group um so the next quarter we should be able to transition well our main approach is collaborate innovate and unite um and i don't need to explain a little bit more but it's about uh more about getting the right people around the table talking about good things and collaborating um a few good things that we've done um so we have kept our annual conference so last year we had a hybrid conference which we were very happy that there were 100 people which i think some of you were guest speakers as well uh, high, uh online or in person in sheffield oh sorry um uh we had 100 uh, participants um we also had more than 30 plus no 50 plus abstracts sorry yours truly was on the abstract committee and there was a lot of them um, as well as um, we had people tuning in from 50 different countries from the middle platform. So that was great. Um, we also continued with our every other month journal club. So it's truly multidisciplinary. So anesthesia, obs and gynae and um, surgery. So on the most left hand side is Prof Bigard and Dr. Nikki Vickery that was talking about the ASOS 2 trial um, and it's um, picking up a very, very interesting um, process evaluation of what actually happened in uh, ASOS 2. It's a very, um, uh, yeah, it was very inspiring. And same, we don't only talk to doctors. Um, on the last, last one in November, we talked to, to an innovator um, who were talking about how to, um, so this lady on the right corner, um, I would not try and mispronounce it, but she is a biomedical engineer that uh, looks after to make surgical equipment less clunky um, and less parts so that it could be uh, worked in uh, resource pool settings a lot better. She's a very inspiring lady. Now, this is why I am currently in Joburg and then I'll be in Rwanda and Uganda very soon. So um, virtual reality in medicine and surgery, so RIMS from now on, I'll say it, um, is founded to actually um, help um, in terms of uh, creating medical and surgery learning environment in a virtual reality uh, environment, but also in a low-cost environment. This is why I'm here. So we have partnered with RIMS um, to actually teach about advanced airway and plan A blocks in a place called um, Kabali in Uganda. Um, so currently we are doing in-person, and so we're going to teach all the plan A core blocks as well as VL, as well as front of net access. And you can join us if you have some cardboard headsets uh, on the middle platform. But if you don't have it, all it means is you don't have the YouTube link to put on your VR headsets to follow. However, it will still be filmed and followed. So um, one, of the, one of us, one of the faculty can't come because she's in Sudan and clearly can't fly. So I'm very sad about this, but I'm hoping all will be well. So for those who, um, can come, I'll see you on 19th and 20th, so Wednesday and Thursday, yes.
This is also another great thing that has been happening. It's the Frugal Innovation Skills course. Some of you might have heard about it, joins it. We've got a very good grant that talks about frugal innovation as its concept in five different series. And then at the end, there is a hackathon, a pitch thing, and we've got a seed fund um, to seed um, those frugal innovations. It's ongoing, it's on a monthly basis. You can dip in and out if you like the core cool topics. Again, it's on the medal platform. If you look up Gasop on the medal platform, just type in frugal, then you see all of the timetable coming up. We continue to be very well supported by Dr. Keith Thompson, um, who has a travel grant that helps us um, to uh, give uh, doctors 500, up to 500 pounds for their trips abroad if they're doing that things. Um, so this is what we are at the moment. Um, again, join our mailing list if you want to. Uh, join our working group if you want to. Um, so we've got four different work, working group. One is curriculum design and inclusion. One is research, one is in, innovation, and one is education and training, um, all of which we need a lot of people to join. And that'd be absolutely amazing. And a little bit of sneak peek for anesthesia. We don't know how we landed here, but it's happening. So we're joining forces with the colleges, uh, the Royal College of Anesthetists uh, Global Partnerships Program, me and Fiona, which I should have told, mentioned her at the very beginning. Fiona is the other UK anesthetic rep. And some of you, I think Nate is on the list. Uh, Hannah is also on the list to be uh, interviewed by me and, um, and also interviewed by Fiona uh, once we get all the diaries sorted. Um, it's more to just, uh, talk about the global partnerships that has been happening, the experiences, and also talk about genuinely um, improve, improving the profile of global partnership and global anesthesia. Then there is VR, which I've talked to you about. Um, we're thinking about we doing it in another country next year, hopefully, maybe. Um, and when the content comes out with all those blocks, we can send them all to you and they should be free for access to all. So it could be as little as a cardboard VR headset that's linked to a smartphone, which is three pounds in on eBay at the moment. Um, but you can actually have an immersive look into where the hands and where the ergonomics are. At the same time, also have an overlay of ultrasound to know what's happening. The next thing that's going to happen, which is currently in discussion, we had a chat with, I think, um, Emma and Anna and Dylan um, about um, potentially a research online um, course. So I've scratched a few people's heads around um, and looked up a few funding. And then on our next meeting, we should be able to talk a little bit more concrete. And that will be linked up with ZADP uh, with their um, ZADP in both sites uh, and their student and their timetable as the major core. Um, so I've spoken to Professor Tim Cook and I've spoken to someone at the BJA. They seem to have funding for these kind of initiatives. So I'm going to have a look at if we can scratch those monies. And we have a great team. Welcome to join us. Welcome to follow us. And this was us. We, it was quite surreal that we've been organising a conference. This is the whole committee. and We've never met each other because of the whole COVID. And then it was quite a nice time when we were at the conference and finally met, met each other. But yeah, that is the end of me talking and I'm sure I've overrun a lot and sorry, Emma. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Dan. That's really, really helpful and a massive overview of what you've been doing in both organisations. I don't know how you keep up. I'm so impressed. <laughs> um, and I hope things go well. There's some familiar names on that, uh, that course poster that you put out, including Arthur, Maria, so that's great. I hope you have a fantastic time. Um, so next up is the Royal College and um, Maria, who most of you will know and has been instrumental in helping us organise these days uh, and has been in the background working away today to help us out with the audiovisual. So I'm going to hand over. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm going to hand over to Maria for her RCOA update. Wonderful. Thanks, Emma. Um, I should flag really that um, Rahini has actually been doing all the heavy lifting today um, in terms of the AV stuff. So a big thank you to Rahini who works with me at the college. Um, also, thank you to everybody um, for inviting us. Um, I know it sounds cliche, but I genuinely enjoy the G GADP faculty days. It's one of my favourite days of the year um, professionally. So I'm delighted to be here with you all and to give a bit of an update on what the RCA have been up to. 
Um, a lot of it has actually been touched upon already um, by other contributors, which is fantastic. So you don't need to listen to me drone on for too long. Um, so as you saw in the presentation earlier um, that Dr. Emma Lilly gave, <clears throat> we provided um, some support for a remote educational supervisors day, which included delegates from Zambia um, and actually other countries as well. We opened it up um, to quite a few people, um, which was a fantastic day. It was it, so delighted that it was finally able to happen, um, having been delayed a few times. And obviously um, with the pandemic, it's been difficult to kind of um, pin that down. Um, but a fantastic group of people, a fantastic faculty and huge amounts of learning for us um, for what we can do going forward and how we could potentially develop such a course and make it um, much more um, applicable and useful to everybody and perhaps more widely available. Um, so that's been fantastic. Um, alongside that also, as Emma mentioned, um, we've got the remote educational supervisor role, um, which we touched upon earlier. Um, so looking at the developments around that and how we might expand that role a little bit more um, to include not just UK trainees, but also kind of wider on the ground support. Um, another big area that we've been working with, um, and this has been in collaboration with THET, um, with some THET funding, and also, I know um, Sonia Akrimi is on the call um, as, as a delegate today, which is unusual. Um, but we've been working together with the Ghanaian College of Anaesthetists um, to develop the anaesthesia curriculum, um, which we kind of provided some input into sort of earlier on. And we're now um, working collaboratively with them. And also, um, I'm delighted um, with input from Zambia and also Ethiopia to have regular meetings around um, particular subspecialty areas or curriculum areas where people kind of feel sort of a collaborative effort within the region and learning from each other um, is useful. So we're having kind of monthly meetings around those, which has been fantastic and really enlightening. I've been earning, uh, learning a huge amount from those discussions. Um, I'm also really excited that we've developed a teaching program, um, <coughs> excuse me, which <coughs> we start next week. So every fortnight, we're going to be having an online um, uh, lecture, um, which is going to be um, with faculty from all of the countries. We've got um, representation from Ghana, from Zambia, from Ethiopia, and also the UK um, with consultants and also with residents um, covering a particular area. Um, we'll be very happy to share um, that information. We're just kind of finalizing the, the program now. Um, but I think kind of it'll be interesting for everyone to kind of see um, and do pass on if it's if you feel it's relevant to anybody that you're aware of. Um, also internationally, we've been working so a, li a little bit different. Uh, we've been working with um, Iceland. Um, you may have remembered in previous years we've done some work with Iceland before, um, and we're working with them now. Um, because they're undertaking core training in Iceland, um, because that's kind of one of the, they're wanting to develop a degree of kind of specialty training within country, um, but not a full training program because the numbers are so small. So they've agreed kind of starting with core training. Um, and it's, it's unlikely that it will develop further than that set in, in the interim. But it's been a bit of a change for them because obviously those of you who are in the UK know that we've gone from what was originally core training of two years up to stage one training, which is now three years, and that's kind of causing some logistical challenges for, um, um, for them. So we're kind of convening a group to kind of see um, what the way forward is there, uh, whether a change is needed or indeed if a change is needed. It's uh, all very much up for discussion at the moment. Um, I think we were also, Jan mentioned uh, podcasts, so you're going to be seeing a lot of content coming out from a lot of the uh, fantastic people that you've heard speaking today. Um, so watch this space, we'll be sure to uh, let you know um, when those are recorded and going out. Um, also, as well as having um, sort of international work sort of outside of the UK, uh, Rohini and I have quite a large remit of um, sort of international medical graduates coming into the UK. It kind of sits under us um, to provide support for individuals who haven't trained in the UK but are wishing to undertake training um, within the NHS. Um, most of you will have come across the medical training initiative before, um, so I won't talk about that too much. Um, but what I did want to flag is um, we've been working with a lot of other 
um, clinicians and organisations to help to promote um, international medical graduate inductions. Um, one of the big challenges that we, we certainly hear from our MTR doctors and others is when doctors arrive in the UK and they're starting to work, kind of the particular kind of pastoral side of things um, is really variable across the UK. Um, so we're kind of looking to see how it is that the college can provide some help with that and um, provide some support. So we've introduced some um, induction guidelines as part of our MTI scheme. Um, obviously, we're quite limited in um, the scope that we have to get um, NHS trust across the whole of the UK to do these things, but kind of where we can, um, just promoting good practice and highlighting um, areas that are important. Um, so that's an ongoing piece of work. Um, and finally, just one last thing I wanted to flag um, ourselves, along with an organisation called um, RefuAid um, and the association have put together a refugee buddy scheme, which kind of chimes a little with what we were talking about with the International Medical Graduate Induction. Um, but it's providing support for um, refugee doctors who've arrived in the UK, um, have gone through all the sort of the government processes that they, they need to go through. And they're working their way through getting their uh, kind of their English language um, test results. So the IELTS, the OET, obviously sitting PLAB to get GMC registration. Um, so they're quite well supported by the um, by RefuAid around that area. But what they're really interested in is having some support from anaesthetists who are in the system who can actually provide that lived experience of providing support for individuals. Um, so we've been running a pilot this year um, with small numbers. We've had eight uh, refugee doctors that have been matched with UK doctors. Um, and we're looking, we've had a, a refugee uh, buddy day where everyone, well, not a few people came to the college who were able to. Um, so they've, we've had that and we're looking now for the next reliteration of that. So we're looking to have kind of our second year running in September. Um, if it's something that you, as, a, as an individual, be interested in being a refugee buddy or know somebody who might benefit from such support, um, keep an eye on our the RCOA website because we are going to be pushing quite a lot of comms on, about that in the next kind of month or two. Um, I think that's it from me, really. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anna. Uh, thanks, Maria. That's great. We're moving on to Anna next. He's going to talk about the World Anesthesia Society. Uh, I am just going to share uh, one slide, if I can. Hold on. Uh, maybe now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, I don't think the Zoom is playing the ball, so maybe I will just uh, give the verbal update, might be easier. Uh, so it was actually an exciting year for the World Anesthesia Society. Uh, and last year we organized uh, two virtual seminars, uh, one discussing part partnerships post-pandemic and one focusing on equality in anesthesia. Uh, we also had a couple of new people joining our committee and we have a new president, Dr. Sarah Davidson from Winchester. Uh, Sarah definitely brought uh, a lot of fresh energy into our committee and I'm sure that will help us upscale our activities. Um, as we are emerging from the pandemic or emerge already from the pandemic, we want to focus on reconnecting with our members and creating a um, true community of anesthetists interested in global health. Our longer term plan is uh, creating regional hubs and having more regional events as we are very aware that our events uh, so far have been um, mainly around London. Uh, we also have a new website, worldanesthesia.uk. Uh, it's been completely revamped. Uh, we are also on uh, Facebook and on Twitter. And uh, if you are not a member yet, you can sign up to the website. The membership fee is still only £35 per year, which I think is absolute bargain. Uh, we've been trying to um, 
increase it, but uh, it is staying at 35 for now. Um, you will get a newsletter full of global anesthesia news um, every two months. Uh, we also have new editors of the newsletter, so that's been revamped a bit as well. Um, also, if you want to publish something in our newsletter, for example, about your experience working overseas, uh, please do contact us. Our editors will be very happy to hear from you. Um, and the most important information is that uh, we are running the first in-person seminar since 2019. It will happen on Monday, the 10th of July at the Royal College. Um, thank you for uh, hosting that seminar for us, Maria. Uh, the theme of the seminar will be sustainability um, in its broader sense, not just environmental uh, sustainability. Uh, everyone is welcome to join. Um, lunch will be provided and there'll be lots of opportunities for networking. So I hope to see you there. Uh, I will try to put the link to the registration in a chat in a minute. And I think that's it from me. I hope to see you in July. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. If you want to send me your slide, I can put it up towards the end of the meeting, if that would help. Thanks. Um, and I think it's now Audrey from um, the Tropical Health and Education Trust. Hopefully Audrey's online. Hello. Hi, yes, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. It's not very nice to, to be here and to see everyone again this year. Uh, so I'm going to be very brief uh, on what SET has been doing and also what we are going to focus on this year. Um, we are, because we are very much continuing to work on a lot of uh, the pro project or programs that we started either in 2022 or in previous years. Uh, for instance, we are continuing our support to um, nurses and mid midwives through grants program, uh, focusing on uh, early career nursing and early care nurses, sorry, and uh, midwives to develop their leadership skills. But we are also um, supporting the implementation of in-country programs on various nursing and midwifery um, areas of, for instance, curricular development, uh, multidisciplinary work, and also organizational support to some of the um, nursing associations or midwifery associations and councils in different countries. Uh, one of the main programs that uh, we worked on in previous years, but we are also um, working on this year, is uh, the CPAMS program that you might be aware of. So CPAMS is the Commonwealth uh, Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship, and it's read that every time. Um, and it's a grants program, and we have actually awarded 24, I think, new grants earlier this year um, that are supporting uh, antimicrobial stewardship projects in uh, eight countries. So we have added four new countries to the, um, compared with the previous phase of that program. And this program will run for um, the next two or three years, I think. Um, so again, it's very exciting that we are able to build on what we have done previously and to support a lot of the same health partnerships that we have worked with because um, we have seen that a lot of um, our, programs last year were quite short term and the funding was really low. Uh, we were able sometimes to only provide, you know, grants of five and five thousand pounds or ten thousand pounds for um, a period of maybe six months, which is sometimes tricky for health partnerships to be able to um, properly implement projects or to um, align the funding from us with their long term goals or to make changes to, um, or like to make an, an, an impact um, to the health systems that they want to make an impact on. Uh, so it's it's very exciting that this program will be multi-year. Um, then we have started working in Syria last year. Um, it's something that's quite new for us because we don't usually work um, in conflict affected areas. And this uh, program um, is funded by the uh, EU and is uh, focusing on strengthening medical education in partnership. We are working in partnership with um, 
uh, local um, organization, but also some royal colleges from, from the UK. Um, so again, very interesting work for us because it's, qu it's quite, quite new, um, a new area of focus. Um, some of our focus this year will also be on volunteering, on promoting volunteering and mentorship or mentoring between NHS clinicians and um, clinicians in low and middle income countries. So again, this many will be through a grants program. And if you are interested in that kind of work or in bursaries and grants, I would advise you keep an eye on our website because uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, announce something maybe around the summer. Um, and I'm quite vague at the moment because we don't have uh, all of the details of the programs yet. Um, and then what else I wanted to mention, yes, the um, we are going hopefully again to launch a few um, new grants program, maybe probably towards the end of the year, which will um, support different areas or different health themes, including anesthesia. Um, but again, we don't have details to um, uh, share. So it's, yeah, I will advise you keep an eye um, on our website for any updates on uh, funding available if you are interested. Uh, in terms of uh, SET itself and the organization, we grew quite a lot in the past year and in the past few years, actually, since COVID. Uh, in terms of um, staff, and uh, which is really, really good and really uh, exciting for us. And we, um, there have been some changes in the organization in terms of how the teams are structured. Um, and we also worked on a new strategy last, last year, which I don't think has been shared uh, publicly yet, but hopefully will be soon. And it includes new directions or elements that we have not previously um really focused on so for instance on the um sustainability elements and uh the climate crisis which again will be very interested to to work on uh especially um supporting you know we will be trying to support uh health partnerships or organizations that are interested in these areas um and finally i wanted to mention one challenge that we continue to face this year uh, which I think a lot of you maybe um, are facing as well, is the lack of long-term and substantial funding. Um, we have noticed that in the past year, as I mentioned before, we some of our programs were quite short, and the funding um, or contracts that we have or we had with uh, donors were for maybe a one-year program, and then when we had to develop the programs, a grants program from that, then it was only a six to eight month contract uh, grants program, um, which again is very difficult for health partnership to work with sometimes and measuring the impact of that is not always possible. So I think one of our main focus this year will also to be uh, looking at different avenues for funding and hopefully the funding environment will be a bit better soon, but can't really predict that at the moment. Um, yeah, I think that's everything from that. And if you have any questions, you feel free to contact us. Um, you can get our detail from um, JDB, I think. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Audrey, for your update. And um, I think last but not least, we're just moving on to Lifebox. And it'll be Senate who's going to give us an update on, uh, on Lifebox. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, and hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sanait. I am the head of programs for East and Southern Africa uh, for Lifebox, and I'll try to give you a brief update of what we have been working on for the past year. Um, as as you all know, uh, we have different projects and programs that we implement uh, globally. Um, one of the the major programs that we have been implementing around. Uh, making surgery safer and uh, in reducing surgical site infection, but also improve uh, compliance rates around six process measures and increase teamwork and uh, leadership at the in the OR. 
uh, we have implemented ClinCut um, in Ethiopia, Liberia, India, Madagascar, Cote d'Ivoire, and now a new project that we have started in Malawi, uh, which is ClinCut customized in long bone fracture that we have signed an agreement with two facilities uh, in, in last month. And we are very much excited about it, actually. Um, and also, we have been working. I'm, I'm glad to hear what Audrey was saying about the nursing uh, project. We have started also a new project that was that is funded by uh, Cathedral Foundation, which is around nursing and midwifery uh, to strengthen again the leadership and uh, soft skills of nurses in perioperative area. That. This is being piloted in Ethiopia and Liberia uh, this year, and hopefully to to do more facilities uh, than the the four pilot areas and um, the two countries uh, in the coming few years. And we have been also conducting safe war trainings, um, as Jolene was mentioning earlier. Um, the safe war uh, training we also deliver in different countries uh, that we had in Bangladesh, and also. We have been customizing it around um, Team Clift uh, with, with Smile Train, and we have conducted this training in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya. It had actually a very good turnout and a very good um, response from, from these teams. We have been also uh, distributing and surveying around uh, headlights, uh, pulse oximeters, and capnography, which I'll come back uh, about capnography a bit later. And we have uh, definitely, we have been seeing um, a lot of requests from around um, the globe where we are uh, implementing our programs to have more uh, pulse oximeter and headlights uh, that we are yet uh, to, to finalize uh, the, the survey. Um, and, and also we have been training uh, different healthcare professionals virtually also around the surgical safety checklist, but also the customized one for COVID. Uh, this was particularly um, in partnership with the College of Surgeons, uh, anesthesia providers, gynecologists, and nurses around the East, Central, and Southern Africa uh, that we are very much grateful about. And um, we have this, this one was uh, the very exciting one that we have conducted in January, uh, where the, the Smile Train Lifebox Partnership and WAFSA uh, GCAP, which is the Global Capnography Project, uh, and other partners developed and worked together around uh, a program that works, uh, hold on, uh, that works around um, capnography and uh, adopting, uh, sorry, for a couple of minutes. Apologies. Um, so around uh, capnography and the, the, the development of this uh, document that we have been working on has been tested in Ethiopia uh, for three facilities, actually for three groups, uh, one group of anesthesiologists, physician anesthesiologists, and uh, two groups of non-physician anesthesia, anesthesia providers with a total of uh, around 40 something um, trainers, trainees that we have trained and um, the material had received a lot of positive feedback, uh, but also there are minor adjustments that we are expecting to work on. And this showed us also another um, request that, that, that came from our uh, definitely trainees, but also uh, where we have uh, submitted the reports also with Smile Train that there is a lot of requests uh, of capnography uh, to be donated uh, around the region. So these are the major um, happenings that we have been working around. Uh, definitely, we can send a report as somebody was mentioning earlier, and you can also uh, go through our website uh, for much of the updates that are uploaded in there, uh, but definitely happy to share the report. Thank you so much. Thank you, that's great. And so I think that's all of our updates for today. A fantastic group um, and really, really interesting to hear what everybody's getting up to.